Hi, I am Nancy LT Hamilton, and no, I am not hungover. <laughs> I just, really, this is true. I am so lazy, I didn't want to put on eye makeup. Go figure. I had a hard day yesterday, worked really hard at Chimera, and I'm still recovering, so please bear with me. I, li I put lipstick in, in my little face makeup on, but that's all I could handle. <laughs> Anyway, it's a good way to start this very strange and unusual video because this video is just like my brain threw up. Uh, <laughs> there's all these random things that really have no relationship to one another except for the fact that they are for jewelry making. And uh, there's some tips and tricks and, well, let me actually I have a list. I'm gonna read that for you and see what it's done. Um, we're gonna start with dealing with that copper build out that happens sometimes when you heat. <laughs> And Q-tips. So it's just totally random. Just totally random. And if, if that bothers you, I apologize. <laughs> so thank you for joining me. And we shall get started now. So here we have some metal before torching. Pretend I'm making something. This is brass. This is bronze. I'll meet you in a second. Remember these guys? Brass. Bronze, this is after pickling and after brass brushing. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, what happened to my work? Well, don't panic. It's just copper that's wiggled its way up to the surface and it's nothing that super pickle can't fix. So I'm going to show you how to make some super pickle with a turkey basta. All right, so what I've got here is a jewelry dedicated turkey baster to get pickle out. We're going to make the super pickle. And this I found is the best way to do it. So oh, I'm going to fill part of it. I don't need more than that. Hot pickle. You want hot. Put this into your um, baking soda mixture and squeeze it out and then rinse it. Lots of slurping sounds. <laughs> Household hydrogen peroxide, equal amount as I put in the pickle. This is very rough estimating here. Then I'm just gonna, well, that almost fits in there. We'll, we'll be able to see partly cleaned and partly not cleaned. I'm gonna throw the other one in. I can get it in there. So there we have it in there and it's working. So I can't see because that's in the way. You can see it changing before your eyes. So if you leave this in a while, you end up with a matte finish on it, which is pretty on the bronze. I like it on, on that. Um, but you don't have to. And I don't know. I could leave that a little longer. So here's our clean brass, clean-ish brass that I put in the baking soda mix and then threw it into the rinse bowl. You can see this um, bubbling in there. It's all the copper being eaten off. So what you can do, what you do afterwards is let this sit overnight covered away from your creatures and yourself and your family and then pour it back into your pickle because the hydrogen peroxide turns to water and uh, you've just got a slightly diluted pickle so it's all win it's a win-win I think I'll come back to you when this is clean it's taking a little longer oh one more thing um, it, this also occurs on sterling silver because it contains copper so sometimes you'll solder and pull your piece out and see the copper surface so that can be cleaned with this method or with sanding it's just easier to dunk something in just remember that if you leave it in too long it will etch somewhat so here is our bronze 
it's a little gunky looking, but I bet this would clean up pretty quickly with brass brush. If you don't have a brass brush, get a brass brush. You want not one that looks like that. This is what happens when they get old. Um, but you want the really soft tons and tons of little teeth or what other those are called hair brush hairs I have no idea every time I solder I hit it with the brass brush because usually with copper products that it, it tends to leave a little film on the top and with fine silver you'll see that the silver turns white and you can just brass brush that off don't panic it's all right I'm testing out the spiders I think that's what it's called soldering tool and I just took this piece of um, silver stuck it in a, the <laughs> vertical position kind of balance the leg of the spider on top of this um, one thing I want to say about this I wish it was a little smaller it's kind of worrisome that it's gonna fall off the edge of my block and I have a big block um, but anyway, I've already heated up my flux on here, and I'm just going to, we're just going to solder with it, because that's what we do. Right, I'm just going to put one there. This is not a piece of jewelry, by the way. It's a test piece. So far, it hasn't collapsed. So it's a good sign. All right, we got flow. So um, that's that's that part of the test. It seems to have held upright and didn't become too much of a heat sink that the solder didn't flow. So, yay. Okay, we have Mr. Spider out again, but I'm not talking about its use, and hopefully it's not going to fall down on me. Um, what I, w I if you can see, there's a pattern on this material, and I don't want solder to flow into it. it doesn't color as well with liver of sulfur, um, among other things like filling in the pattern. So I put the flux up on the wall of the um, piece I'm soldering to it. And then I'm going to pull out my yellow ochre, which if you buy a can, it'll probably last you a lifetime. You really need so little. I just let it dry up in a, this little container and then just spritz a little water. And then you want to paint yellow ochre up to the area. It's hard to get in here with you. Ah, oh, shoot. I just got it in the seam. So... I'm just going to go ahead with the demo anyway. I'm hoping it doesn't wend its way down the road there. Don't get it in the seam. <laughs> That's my tip. So we're going to heat this mess up. Hopefully the flux will counteract the effect of the ochre. I put my solder on. Do 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 da 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 da. Come on. Okay. Now for the big, the big moment you've all been waiting for, watching me obliterate the piece with the torch. So the. Yellow ochre essentially dirties the metal up, so you can use many different products for this. Some use whiteout, but whiteout's kind of toxic. Um, you know, you can use a chalk powder, or what else can you use? Graphite, other stuff. Are you flowing? I'm almost melting you, so I hope you're moving. I'm going to check that seam. Boy, that got hot. I think I'll do a little fire scale stain test on this afterwards. Okay, I'm going to pick a lip and we'll check it out. Well, here's our little piece. Um, the flux overrode the, the effects of the um, yellow ochre. God, 
words come to me so quickly. Um, so it did solder all the way through and I don't have any in the pattern, which is good. So that's just one trick for keeping things out of recesses, patterns, or let's say you're working with gold and silver. You know, you want to paint maybe the gold up with the, if you're using silver solder, paint the gold with some yellow ochre to keep the cleanup down to a minimum, which is always our goal in life. Less work, more play. This is such a random video. I'm like, okay, what am I going to tell people about? Um, by the way, I found this book that's by Paul Liebold that's really good on stone setting, but it's not as good as John Cogswell's on steppies by steppies. But it does show you a lot of d tons of different settings. And if you are uh, an experienced jeweler, you can tell by looking at some of the drawings how these things were put together. You know, this kind of stuff. Um, he talks about wax settings and bright cutting and cutting seats with gravers and burrs and what else we got here? Grading and evaluating diamonds, gemstone shapes, treated gemstones, Lots of, lots of good information. I, I'm calling this a welcome addition to my library. Okay, another thing I wanted to talk about. This is something I've been messing with, by the way. This is not what I want to talk about. It's, uh, I've been tying these, let's see how close I can get without blurring, these knots in metal and making chain elements with it. So I don't know where it's going. It's going over there. Here we have something, not this, but these, that I think um, a lot of people don't really delve into a lot when they're first starting jewelry making. And I'll tell you, um, in the la latter years of my making story, um, I've really become a file hoe, to, to put it officially. <laughs> I, I adore files because number one, they save me a lot of work and I have a lot more control over what I'm working with, um, especially with stone setting or minute pieces. So I've really become a deep and fond lover of escapement files, which are these little weeny, tiny weeny ones. Here's a needle file in comparison. It's like a Mack truck. Um, so I rarely use my needle files anymore, except, you know, for ring shank finishing or something but these I use for all my details um, and I m make sh I really need a couple more I, I want a four square this is a three square here um, but I, I like them in a five and these are my eights over here really fine fine files so um, you know as, as you start moving on in your career just realize that maybe one of the things you're missing to help you create more pristine, better executed work is to get yourself some escapement files. I know Rio Grande sells them and Auto Fry sells them. So uh, happy shopping. So I don't typically like to bash anything. Um, I figure there's enough nastiness in the world without me adding. But sometimes I encounter a product that I just don't understand. Um, I even forgot what these are called. Where's my dang paperwork? Oh, sorry. These are called cylinder anti-clastic one by one eighth by six sixteenth channel. Now, I, I don't know if I'm just an idiot, which is pretty true most of the time, but all this does that I can see on and on this metal, which is, I don't even know what gauge it is. Let us check that out of, notice I'm speaking in Old English today. That's because I'm old today. I was at Chimera all day yesterday and just not happy. This is 18 gauge. And um, this is all I could do. So I found a piece of, this is almost like foil. What the heck, this is probably close to 30. 
do do. Here we go with the do 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 again. Yep. Dirty. By the way, for those of you who don't know how to work a big S gauge, first slot it doesn't fit into. Right, maybe this is 28. Maybe I was. No, nope, it fits in 28. Is um, the size, the gauge of the metal. So 30. Um, anyway, so I'm going to try these on the 30. Now, I thought because this is circular that the metal would curl around. So maybe it'll work for, but it's still not curl around. Definitely works better on this thin annealed metal. But, you know, it makes a rim, but it makes all these lumps. Now, you might want that for a decorative element. I don't. I can make these dents with a punch on a piece of wood and a hammer. Then I found these, and I'm not bitching about these because um, I think these have great potential. Um, these are heavy-duty electrical doodying, you know, for cutting and stripping wire. But look at the pattern in there. That's pretty cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grind down these teeth. And just with this part here, I've been able to make these ridges on here. Let's see how it looks on 30 gauge. I think if I file some of the teeth down, I'll have a nice ridge forming tool. There is some, some marring there, so I'm going to also round and smooth those edges so I don't get this. But this makes a channel, which is what I, I was looking for with the other ones. Um, and I'm hoping once I get rid of this point here that I'll be able to mix tiny channels by putting it in this area. Right now, this this the this cutting part is getting in my way. Okay, another tool I'm going to bash. This is, remember, this is not a bash. This is an idea waiting to be happening. Um, this, oh my god, I was so excited about it. I posted on Facebook. I ordered one from China. And what it does is I have a, a quick change release hand piece. Wait, I'm going to go get it. Ah, hold on. Don't go away. There it is. And the way that you use it is you squeeze this and it opens the jaws inside. So this just fit in here. So what this means is that I could use all different size burrs and bits in here without having to switch the hand piece to my traditional Fordham that you have to use a key with. So I was so excited, except for when I, when I turned this on and it spun in an arc. And um, those of you who know this, when you turn on a flex shaft and your tool is spinning in an arc, it's not in there, right? And this is just, there's something that is not square on here. So sadly, I need to bash this. I wanted it to work. Maybe I can find some kind of engineering genius to fix it for me, but I have a feeling that the, the threading is off on the interior. It is not a finely machined tool. If anybody out there wants to make one, I would be ever so grateful. Um, and I think that's that for this part. My brain is going to be thinking of other tips and things. This is I'm going to call this the weird video. So since I bashed the tool, I should speak highly of tools. Um, I will put the link to this Chasing a Repose Hammer, which is a gorgeous. Feels so good in your hand. Really heavy head. Feels like nothing. Perfect spring. Boom, boom, boom. And these, my favorite cutters, Max, Power Max, I think they're called on Rio. They're called, Kiba makes them in their Power Up series. And they're saying, what is the Max saying? 2.3 soft wire. I don't know, they cut pretty good, they cut pretty thick wire. Flush cut on one side and that V-shaped cut on this side. But I love these. So I thought I'd have to balance the universe out because <laughs> I get nervous. I do. So here's another trick. I love my little um, brushes that I make out of toothpicks. I just take a hammer. I can use either end. I like this end. And I spread the fibers on the end of the toothbrush. I can even spread them more, but I don't want to. I don't want to annoy you. Um, so what it, I, it does is it becomes like a little brush, and I use these for mixing two-part epoxies or spreading super glue. 
um, and other things that I can't think of right now. <laughs> so that's like a cheap, easy trick. And um, the other trick, and I made a whole bunch of these, and I, I have completely lost them. So I'm going to have to make them again, uh, this one again, just to show you. So if you've got a jaw of, of a vise that are really rough, and they, you keep wrecking your metal every time you put it in the vise, you can make magnetic jaws. So I vaguely match the shape of this and have some magnetic strip that I got from Yale Amazon that's got a sticky back and essentially I'm just gonna you could measure and be like one of those people but unfortunately I'm not so I'm just gonna cut this to approximate size and then um, it's a little curly in the beginning but what I did was I, I put it on here and made sure I press it down really firmly. You you want to go with a thicker leather. The suede is not perfect. Um, I like more of the cowhide. It's got a harder surface. But what I do is then I put it into, let me just knock everything on the floor. Let's imagine there's two pa a, a pair in here and I just tighten down my vise and hold it. Okay, get in there. Squeeze it tight and just let it sit for, you know, a couple hours. I think that just uh, this pressure on it will just help the glue adhere more evenly. So then you've got fabulous magnetic jaws that you can, you don't have to hold on to them when you're putting things in and out. They just magnetize right to the walls of the, walls of the, vice except these aren't ready yet another reason i do this is to flatten the magnet it's been in a roll for a long time so you might need to leave it overnight just wish i could find my other ones just depressing anyway those are a couple of more tips so this is another idea this is a storage idea i got a piece of scrap acrylic this is a pvc what do they call it? A four inch coupling hub. And then this is a, a drain cover for B PVC drains. And I find that it makes fabulous screwdriver storage. And I just stuck this inside here. This is uh, the bottoms attached with acrylic cement. Put a weight on top of it while it dried. And that's what I got. So that's, that's a great way to store screwdrivers and other, you probably could do files in here. The only thing with that would be that they're rubbing on each other and that's not good for the teeth. So I'm sure there's other uses. I just call it my screwdriver storage. I do. While we're talking about storage, I might as well talk about my hammer holder. I, I love these. This is like a garage door organizer made by, who is that? Unger? Unger. And what I like is number one, it's got these rubber necks on here so it won't mar any of the wood. And you just push it in and it locks them wherever. Do it up here if I wanted to. And they're easy to get in and out. There isn't a ton of pressure like some of the hooks that I've tried for holding hammers. And they're right behind my bench. So I just spin around like a ballerina and take them unawares. So what we are looking at here is my big girl vice. And... You know, if you put a tool like this forming tool in a vise and you hammer on this end, what ends up happening is you end up with it like this. So I made little holders out of pretty thick brass um, and just shaped them. These were basically bent around, but you can use a um, ring mandrel to shape them. And then just bend the ends over like that and they slip in here um, you might want to make <clears throat> different size ones for different tools like on a ring mandrel generally you're going to have one that's larger than the other because this is a cone so you fit the end in one end and then the smaller piece would go in the front and tighten down and this will keep the mandrel from I mean it's still it's not perfect but it's still it makes it a ton better than 
not having any support in here. Oh my God, look what I found. <laughs> my vice jaw covers. <laughs> it's amazing what you can find. Look, I'll just have to show them to you now. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Just absolutely stunning. <laughs> so we're gonna swing you literally over to here. Because I want to talk about this. Actually, I'm going to take you out of the holder and handhold you. This is a pipe vise, and some people already have heard me proclaim the wonders of this tool. Um, but I use this for bracelet mandrels, bezel mandrels, ring mandrels, um, my clastic and anti-clastic forming tools. Um, and I think this cost me $35. So I love this. I love this. I love this. And while we're over here, I'll show you another little tippy I did. Um, honestly, I don't remember what this handle is from. Maybe an old file. I put a little hook on the end of it and drilled it out and s cut the um, cross pieces of my chuck key off and stuck it in here uh, with some uh, two-part epoxy. And now what I can do is I have a little hook that I hang this on so I always know where it is. Actually, I'm not using it right now because it's supposed to be over there and it's not. Um, so those are a couple more tips. I'm just full of it, aren't I? <laughs> more ways than one. So this little darling is my uh, tube cutter. By the way, buy the best you can afford. What's important on these is this little space in here. It needs to be thin enough. Thin enough that it does the blade doesn't wiggle while you're sawing. It helps to keep straighter cuts. And you can also don't forget to use this to mark how wide your tubing is going to long your tubing is going to be because then you can cut multiples at the same length, which comes in handy for chain making or if you're doing a bunch of hinges. Anyway, what I did simply was unscrewed the handle. Well, okay, I'll do it all the way. I have to now screw it in and literally found the center and cut a hole uh, a piece of brass and the reason that I did this let's see if I can screw it in again is number one it fits um, between my bench pin V and the other thing is when I saw tubing and I'm sure this happens to you the tubing tends to gravitate towards the floor it's like a hangout for tubing and gemstones so the, having the metal here actually reduces the, the tendency for the tubing to join in its friends on the carpeting or the floor or whatever. I actually think I need to make this even bigger so that I have a larger table for it to not fall on the floor with. So I think I'm about tipped out for the day. Um, I just saw one thing that might be interesting. I don't know, but let me look. This little guy. Now this this is, kind of looks like poop. <laughs> it's this is polymer clay, and um, this is a long needle in here. This is a tool I used for metal clay work, but I've also done this, and I don't know where they are right now. Um, with scribes and um, other things like if you want to make a hand drill, you can put a drill bit in here. The thing with, with the polymer clay is it's they make great handles and you can also squeeze it so that you get an ergonomic grip on them. So you can do this with a bunch of different tools that would be difficult to hold. Um, like you could do file handles with polymer clay. Speaking of polymer clay, oh God, why do I do this to myself? Don't forget about, as Nancy rummages around in her studio, ah, Sorry, I'm always so organized. It's, it scares some people to see how organized I am. I'm like, wow, I wish I was more organized like Nancy is. This stuff is awesome for making handles, hammers, uh, holding work. At the my uh, bezel setting video I use uh, just plain jet set, but this stuff is like tough and it's uh it has kevlar in it so but you can't make they say don't it's not bulletproof so don't be i love that don't become a poster child for natural selection 
<laughs> and I know that I know there's some of you out there who would try to make a bulletproof vest out of this. But anyway, it's an awesome holding tool making thing. And one more. It's amazing. All these little ideas are coming. This is another fabulous tool for the studio. Um, I use it sometimes to wick away excess flocks. Um, I can use it to do similar to the to the toothpick brush um, to spread, you know, epoxy and stuff. The only thing is you got to worry about is excess furage. So sometimes if you just get it slightly damp and twist it down, it'll it'll work for that. It also makes a great little paintbrush. I did my whole bedroom that way. I'm an idiot. It's like cutting your lawn with scissors. Uh, okay, well, I think I'm going to shut up and go away. I have a guest. This is Petey. This is the mommy of like Ralphie and Lulu's mom, who's Lulu's still around. Petey is 21 and is still a biot. So, anyway, uh, thank you for coming and joining me today. Don't forget, I'm on Facebook. I have a personal page that you can become a friend with me on, um, and also a business page, Nancy LT Hamilton Jewelry. I am on Craftsy, where I've done a, a prong setting from start to finish video. I also have a video for sale on my homepage called Stop, Stop. This is the one you may have seen the other video where she digs, um, called the Riveted Portrait Pendant. Um, Pinterest, sometimes Instagram, <laughs> it's hard to keep up. Uh, anyway, I wanted to uh, announce also that I've been elected to be on Rio's Tool Advisory Board. And I'm going to be flying to Albuquerque this month to, to meet with the group for the first time. So I'm really excited about that and really honored to be asked to do this. Um, obviously, it's right up my alley being the having a tool problem and all. But anyway, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe and like. It doesn't take a lot of effort, really. It, I've done it. I've liked videos. I've subscribed to other people. And uh, I'm going to go away now. Let's come say goodbye, Petey. Oh, she's like holding a porcupine. All right, thank you. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>